Thank you, sir. A number of guests duly introduced by fellows beg leave to attend your meeting. Is it your pleasure that I welcome them in your name? And um, before we go on with the formal business, can I um, welcome also um, a delegation led by Mr. Hu from the Shanghai uh, Art Collection Museum who have been visiting us here today. Very great welcome to you all. It's a very pleasure, great pleasure to uh, welcome you to the society. Minutes. Good evening, everyone. Um, fellows, affiliates, affiliates online, fellows online, um, and our esteemed guest. Thank you very much for visiting today. The minutes, Society of Antiquaries of London, ordinary meeting, Thursday, 30th November, 2023, Burlington House and online. Professor Martin Millet, president in the chair. The minutes of the ordinary meeting of Thursday, the 23rd of November, 2023, were read and signed. The following, being in attendance and having signed the obligation required by the statutes, were duly admitted as fellows. Christopher Edwards, Laura Ratcliffe Warren, and Tim Underhill. The following communication was then laid before the Society, the creation of the modern English page and book by Professor Richard Wendorf, FSA. Thanks were returned for this communication. The Vice President announced that the next meeting would be Thursday, 7 De December, 2023. Then during the meeting, a reception followed. Is it your pleasure that after correcting Vice President, President uh, that I sign these as correct? Uh, thank you. We now come to the main business of this evening's meeting, which is to hear a paper by our fellow um, Professor Ian Haynes and uh, his colleagues from the Rome Transform project. Um, Ian uh, is, uh, if I could say so, an old friend of mine. Uh, he's Professor of Archaeology at the University of Newcastle upon Tyne and Chair of Archaeology at the British School at Rome. He's been a uh, principal investigator of the uh, ERC Rome Transform project uh, for, must be four years now, Ian. Um, and he, as well as being a fellow of this society, he's a member of the Academia Europea. Um, in addition to his well-known work uh, in Rome that he's talking about this evening, um, Ian has also published widely on the Roman army and uh, runs a series of projects or has run a series of projects um, on Hadrian's Wall and in its environs, including current excavations at Third Oswald. So it's a great pleasure to welcome Ian this evening uh, to speak on uh, Rome from the Principate to Late Antiquity, Lessons from the Eastern Caelian. Ian. Thank you very much, Martin. Thank you very much, uh, colleagues, for giving me this opportunity to talk to you about the work of my colleagues and I as part of the Rome Transform project. I continue to be fascinated and hypnotized by this particular uh, piece of technology, uh, but I realize that I'm coming in a little bit ahead of its timing. So we'll just uh, wait for the projector to run. And, and I should warn you, I've timed this lecture perfectly otherwise. Thank you. Right, very good. Right. Um, a little bit in terms of context. Rome Transformed is a four, five-year project, actually, four years in, uh, in the southeast of ancient Rome, focusing on the Caelian Hill, particularly the eastern part of it. Why this area? It's extremely important when we think about the history of Rome because it is actually a space that is outside the ancient Pomerium, largely outside the ancient Pomerium, at the start of the period we are studying, that is the Principate, around about the first century CE. Um, but it becomes, I would argue, the central place uh, in Rome uh, by the 
eighth century. How does it do that? Why does it matter? Why does it have ramifications beyond Rome? Now, if we're trying to understand uh, the archeology span of this area, if we're trying to understand the bigger questions, it's necessary to go back to the essential uh, preliminaries of actually ensuring that the data that we're capturing and using is of the highest quality possible. So I will slightly gloss over all of the details of the initial data capture. I will speak briefly about the original and I hope innovative ways we try and integrate that data, but I will emphasize more strongly some of the lessons that are coming through from this project about the processes of transformation uh, that are so important uh, in Rome's history and are revealed through the project. So the four interlocking systems for data capture, I think one of the most important things to note is this is largely non-intrusive work. So we work on structural analysis, uh, geophysical survey, and this is the largest archaeological geophysical survey ever undertaken in Rome, a program of environmental sampling, um, and an extensive program of historical and archival research. So although we are not actually digging, we are certainly getting above ground and underground and grubby quite frequently in our quests for data. The area, some 68 hectares, includes quite an array of significant archaeological sites, many of them inaccessible to the public and quite a number subterranean. In order to manage the detail and the space, because geospatial management is an essential part of this program, we've divided our research area into nine constituent parts. Two of those, the Claudio Neuronian Aqueduct and the Aurelian Wall, are very substantial monuments in their own right. If we look at the research area, get a little bit of a sense of the kind of challenges we face. I'm going to uh, essentially focus on three broad areas within the larger research area to keep the narrative, I hope, more or less coherent. A large concentration of what I'm going to be telling you about is in the area of the Lateran Basilica, the archaeology here, which is at the western end of our research area. I'm also going to be speaking extensively about the area around uh, the Sasorium, Santa Croce in Jerusalem, here at the eastern end. And I'll also spend a little bit of time discussing the view of the Fortress in Aria and our wider understanding of the Aurelian Wall uh, from the perspective of this area. These are just some of the areas we're looking at, but I hope they give a flavor of what we're aiming to achieve. And when I say we, can I just emphasize that throughout this presentation, if I chance on saying something that seems insightful or intelligent, it's almost certainly come from one of my other colleagues, um, and I'm just trying to catch up with them. So keep that in mind. There are a lot of different uh, colleagues involved in all of these different st uh, stages of work. And we try and make sure that we keep uh, talking uh, and integrating data throughout the process. Now, it's therefore systems of data integration where I think perhaps Rome Transformed has something that's maybe a little bit less familiar uh, overall, uh, perhaps to uh, colleagues from some fields more than others. Uh, one of the things we emphasize quite a lot is what we call three-tier visualization, often referred to also as full data set modeling. This is where we're seeking to integrate uh, three-dimensional model geophysics data uh, alongside um, terrestrial laser scan and uh, structure for motion image uh, data of buildings, all of which have been uh, interpreted uh, through, if you like, more traditional uh, structural, architectural, historical uh, approaches. Uh, we also have a system that we then use to test and debate and visualize our data with, and I'll talk about that more, because we emphasize very strongly the notion of visualization as provocation. And I'll talk about how that works within our dialogue and beyond the project team. And in all of this, one of the things that is extremely important to note is just how much the ground surface is changing in Rome over the centuries. Uh, this is something that at one level will be obvious, I'm sure, to everyone here, but doesn't necessarily get factored in quite as much. So modeling ancient ground surfaces and their shifts over time is a big preoccupation for us. It's essential to understand the other wider points. Finally, the interrogative stage is further set by work with uh, 3D geographical information systems. So a little bit on those. Uh, Three-tier visualization sometimes looks um, more grubby than others. It's a working uh, method that we use. 
Here I'm looking at one small area within the larger uh, space at the eastern end of our research site, uh, the area of the Sessorium, uh, the area associated in modern ecclesial topography uh, with Santa Croce in Jerusalem. And here, at a juncture with the Aurelian Wall, uh, we have just a two-dimensional time slice. Now, colleagues who work with ground-penetrating radar will realize that this is a mere slice through an extensive data set. But one of the things that we're particularly interested in is just also to keep visualizing our data in three-dimensional space. So what I'm showing you here is emphatically not publication-ready images, but a glimpse of how we might process some of this. We have the line of the Aurelian wall here in 2D, and you can see a structure emerging here, again in 2D. And what we do here is we are then modeling these anomalies in relationship to one another. An ugly, unsightly image, but one I can look at for quite a long time and helps me to illuminate the relationships between those different elements. Provocation is key to what we do. And by provocation, what we seek to do is to build our array of different disciplinary perspectives together to uh, get a sense of what buildings at particular moments in time would have looked like. That's our aspiration at the level of structures and landscapes. And we're all now very used to seeing high quality visualization produced, but we're also, I'm sure, acutely aware of the risks inherent in high quality computer visualization. Sometimes it offers a compelling argument without actually delivering a justification for the evidence on which it depends. So one of the things that we emphasize very strongly is, mm -hmm. and this is responding to the uh, principles of the London Charter, uh, civil protocols for computer visualization heritage structures. And one of the things we emphasize very strongly is presenting uh, the background information on our visualization alongside the more conventional technical apparatus of site reports uh, in a way that allows colleagues to see our arguments for different iterations, different possible interpretations of structures, um, our counter arguments and the development of those arguments. And to do that, we've developed a system with colleagues at Darmstadt Technical University in Germany, uh, which we call RT Shidoc. And this document has uh, within it, and you can all access it straight away, should you wish, online, uh, information on all of the buildings that we visualize and the different ways uh, we've come to the visualizations we are producing. Now, we see these buildings, both by phase, as building blocks in our journey to a larger discussion of Rome's transformation. But many of these buildings are recognized as of world importance in their own right. And even if they're not, we're trying to do them justice by making as transparent as possible uh, the routes that we've taken to our understanding of their original appearance. RT3D is another area which has a clear importance in terms of how we understand this area and how we integrate our data. RT3D is designed ultimately to produce uh, digital surface or digital terrain models of past ground surfaces. And it's worth remembering that in some of the areas that we are working in, in uh, Rome, the first periods that we're looking at are up to 20 meters below the modern ground surface. In some areas, we're looking at jumps of four to five meters, even within the space of a couple of centuries. So any attempt to interpret individual buildings and their relationship to one another, as part of building a larger picture of transformation, also has to look at that issue of ground surface. And as we go forward, um, I will present to you an example of where not doing that led to a quite fundamentally different interpretation of a key structure. The way we deal with RT3D, I'm going to master this microphone eventually. I think if I just stay in this position, it should be okay. The way in which we deal with RT3D is we feed in an array of specially produced data from the project, borehole data is one core area, geophysical data another, set it alongside legacy data culled from other reports, some of them archaeological and some of them not. And that is actually then introduced into a system that works off a modern digital surface uh, model and allows us to produce DSMs for earlier periods of Roman's occupation and history. If we look then at how that might work as an example of bringing together different systems, um, here uh, I'm 
showing a case study in front of the Lateran Basilica, uh, which uses borehole data um, and two types of geophysical survey that we do, ground penetrating radar and electrical resistance tomography. In this area, you can see there's that large tempting area of green, which is crying out for archaeological attention. And what we've done is we've put in a couple of boreholes into this area from which we extract a very wide variety of information, environmental uh, data, getting a sense of soil science uh, here, uh, geology. Um, we're also uh, hitting archaeology, and we're also able to date some of the deposits here as well. Then taking here a leaf from uh, the Portus project, uh, we actually set those borehole results against uh, electrical uh, resistance tomography uh, sections and sometimes GPR sections as well in order to get a sense of how that data comes together, how it helps with mutual interpretation, uh, but also how it helps us to understand shifts in ground surface and subsurface uh, conditions. Visualizing the structures we encounter through geophysics, uh, we also continue to experiment with other systems uh, including different ways of showing 3D visualization of anomalies um, buried beneath the modern ground surface in relation to that ground surface. And all that in turn uh, fits and fills in with our other ambitions uh, to connect uh, with uh, the innovations in 3D uh, geographical information systems uh, and within Rome, particularly with work on Archaeocita and former Romai both drawing data from those systems and adding substantially uh, to them here in South East Rome. So that's a little bit about data in integration. Now we're at the stage and we're moving through the process now of asking some of the bigger questions about what does all this mean? We've got a lot of landscape change over eight centuries, not necessarily a, a big surprise, but what does that mean in terms of ways that big ideas are actually being articulated in Rome, expounded in Rome, uh, and in some cases transmitted uh, much more widely uh, in uh, society. Let me take you through a few glimpses of Rome as viewed through the project and our collaborating projects uh, in the eight centuries of history with which Rome Transformed is concerned. We start off, as I say, in the Princeford, and at this time we are looking at an area which we might characterize as peri-urban. Uh, after that term usefully applied by Nicholas Purcell to the Porti of, of Rome. Uh, and this is a visualization that actually is not produced by our team. It's the only one I'll show you that isn't produced by our team, but it gives a lovely sense of uh, the landscape uh, on the southeast edge of Rome, immediately adjacent to our research area in the first century. Now, at this time, uh, from an archaeological point of view, we can see an area that is relatively sparsely settled. Uh, those uh, houses that are there are associated with the Forty type, the luxury quasi-rural dwellings beloved of Rome's elite. Um, but a lot of the activity in this area on the fringes of the city proper is taken up uh, with tombs. And we have a lot of evidence that we've been visualizing for the changing landscape of the dead in this part of Rome. We can see that evolution, particularly in the Via Tequilia, the evolution of the tombs. And we can see also alongside that in the image, of course, the dominance of aqueducts in this landscape. And that's a very important point to be mindful of. When I talk about the three-dimensionality of the Eastern Celian, when I talk about the character and particular character of this area, it is extremely important because of its elevation in terms of its role as a route the major hydraulic systems bringing water into the rest of Rome. And we therefore have a substantial element of the program which is also dedicated to understanding the hydraulic aspect of Rome. One of the things that helps us to understand transformation, the dynamics of transformation, is quite literally to look at where is the water going, who is using it, when is the volume increased, when is the volume cut. So this work also involves some quite sophisticated analyses. And in this case, you can see my colleague, Alessa Santucci, um, hard at work on status of the Claudio Moreno aqueduct. 
And it's important to recognize just how much of this landscape would have been traversed by and dominated by aqueducts at this time. Take a modern glimpse of the Piazza San Giovanni Paolo um, in uh, today, uh, for example, and you might miss uh, the way in which this landscape would have looked so different had we been passing through it 2,000 years ago. So that issue about water, the importance of water, access to water in considerable volume, the way those big structures are actually shaping the space actually has other implications for those who are living here. And those who are living here are very much, as we can see from the archaeology, uh, members of Rome's elite. Look, for example, deep underneath the floors of the Archbasilica of San Giovanni in Laterano, the Lateran Basilica, and what you will see are traces of quite a different landscape. Here we've got indications of the courses based at this stage on the natural slope of the Celian Hill, which were occupied by luxury housing. And when I say luxury housing, the different elements that survived from those buildings, now five to six meters under the modern ground surface, uh, point to qualities of work, stonework, decorative work, that stands comparison with contemporary palatial architecture on the Palatine. Highly likely that we're dealing with individuals who were at least frequenting the emperor's circle. So these houses uh, survive to us, and we can analyze parts of them and the way that they occupied the existing and enhanced the existing natural landscape. Under another celebrated Roman landscape, just a uh, uh, structure uh, just adjacent to the Lateran Basilica, uh, the Scala Santa, so-called sacred steps, uh, we have traces of the same phenomenon. Here in the uh, crypt of the oratory of the Arch Confraternity of the Sacred Sacrament, uh, we have traces of another uh, luxurious uh, Roman dwelling, uh, later liberally festooned with fantastic medieval graffiti, indicating the space was open for uh, a long time, and showing work, again, of the highest quality. Uh, so some beautiful houses surrounded by a rural landscape uh, on the fringes of the city. Now, as we see a transition moving through into the first and second century, some of these properties are adapting to new opportunities. And we can identify with considerable confidence one of the properties in our research area, not very far from the Lateran Basilica, as the uh, Horti of Domitio Lucilla, uh, mother of Marcus Aurelius. And this was indeed the future emperor's childhood home. And what we can see in this case through a close analysis of part of that property um, is the development of a series of tabernae on the edge of the property as bigger roads are being drawn through this area and there is more commercial and other traffic to exploit, a movement towards a denser population. Now, what is that movement? Well, it seems possibly to be linked to what happened under the Emperor Severus. And this is one of the big, and I think often under-discussed transformations of Rome. The Emperor Septimius Severus, you will recall, comes to power at the end of the second century CE on the back of a civil war, and he understands the importance of military force. Now, if we look at what's happening in the Celian, there have already been a number of military units dispersed within it. It's far enough away from the center for that not to be seen. It's especially controversial. But Severus ends up at least doubling the number of armed and belted men in Rome. Contemporary sources claim quadrupled the number, though that is an exaggeration. And in this same area that we've just been looking at, we see the dramatic implications of that transformation. We're looking again now at a superimposed plan over the lines of the Lateran Basilica. But actually what you're seeing are traces of walls that lie now uh, up to uh, two meters beneath the basilica's floor. And what you can see is the type of building has changed radically. We are no longer looking at buildings that are simply respecting the old lines of the Celian Hill, taking advantage of its winding curves. What we're now doing is looking at very blockish military architecture. And this comes through very clearly when we actually work in the shadows, in the dark, beneath the Basilica's floor. And this is just a section of one of our laser scans that I hope helps bring the point home. The old luxury housing here, 
is coming through, but the new basement, the brick coffers that provide the basement for the military buildings being introduced here, offer a complete change of orientation. It's a dramatic change in what's going on. Now, I mentioned working in the shadows. In fact, beneath the Lateran Basilica, we have one of the best preserved Roman forts um, that you could wish to, to see, um, but it is not easily accessible by any standards. Here we're working on a Severan street surface beneath the Basilica's floor. Collectively, it is possible from the evidence that we can find there to get a sense of what actually this castra established by Emperor Septimius Severus at the very beginning of his time in Rome uh, would have looked like. This is a cavalry fort. It's designed for the emperor's horse guard. And one of the things that's quite striking from the preservation is just how much like the elite housing of other parts of Rome, some of the interior dwellings look. The castra emerges from our work through multiple observations underneath something like this, something that might look really relatively familiar to any student of Rome's military architecture in the provinces. But one of the points to note is that while we are in Rome and this is military architecture, um, it is no less important to think about this as tactical uh, use of land. We tend not to think of Rome as a tactical space. In reality, the use of this location at the cost of destroying the luxury dwellings that preceded it, is tactical. It follows Rome's expectations of how you use military space on campaign, dominating by ground. In some ways, therefore, uh, the archaeology here shows that the present particular concentration of new military personnel in this part of Rome is dominating the landscape, changing the experience of visiting Rome and also throwing up all sorts of rather dramatic consequences for those who previously enjoyed their luxury gardens. Following on from this, there are other logistical considerations. The increase in number not merely of people, but of horses has implications in terms of water consumption. And this is stepped up too, although interestingly enough, after the Casper is constructed, not before. Elsewhere, Further to the east, there are other developments that form part of the Severan transformation of Rome. I think we must see these other developments to a certain extent as following on from Severus's plan. The linchpin of that plan starts with the militarization of the landscape. And we can see from the dates of the uh, establishments of different buildings that it is forts that are prioritized first, other developments later. And one of the most interesting other developments is what happens in the Sessorium at the eastern end of our research area, below and around what is today the Basilica of Santa Croce in Jerusalem. Now, here we get a glimpse of what we might call the future. We have an extensive new complex, which to a certain extent foreshadows developments we see elsewhere under the Tetrarchy. Heinrich Day, amongst others, has noted the phenomenon of palatial quarters that are veritable new cities emerging. And that's happening at a rather later date elsewhere. Here in the Sessorium, I think we can already see this underway. This is an aerial view of this part at the eastern end of our research area. You will see here the basilica, which itself is substantially made out of Severan fabric. You will see the Amphitheatrum Castrense, uh, ending up being incorporated into the line of the Aurelian Wall. And if your eyes are very good, you will also see elements of what was the largest circus for chariot racing ever built in Rome, the Varian Circus. Over here, for fans of aqueducts, and I know there are many, uh, you can see how the aqueduct system ends up being incorporated into the Aurelian Wall's defensive circle. Now, what did we learn from our study of this area? Well, our study of this area is one of a number of places uh, in the Rome Transformed area where it's been our privilege for our incoming Rome Transformed research team to work closely with colleagues who already have a long, distinguished uh, and uh, extremely effective uh, research history working in those areas. So one of the areas we've worked on quite a lot is the Amphitheatrum Castrense, a very well-preserved uh, part of this complex. And using our methods of 
fully recording uh, digitally all exposed archaeology above and below ground. It's been possible to combine that, as is our want, uh, with other geophysical data, other survey data, archival data, and in this case, the marvelous drawings of Andrea Malagio, uh, in order to get a better understanding of what the amphitheater of Castellense would have looked like when it was constructed in the third century. Now, I start with this building, but our most recent work demonstrates that this is not, in fact, the first element in the new Sisorian palatial complex. Other elements preceded that. And to better understand that, we have to come to the other side of that basilica entrance that I showed you a moment ago, um, and to look at the back of the basilica, because here we can see traces of a number of very distinctive features. Still elements of the large Severan fabric that's been incorporated into the late church, traces of elaborate porticus here, and elements also of the circus designed, and I think again of Heinrich Day's idea about veritable new cities, to bring together elements that are later to become very familiar and important to architecture, the juxtaposition of porticos, of atrium reception rooms, and also of circuses. Another shout for the Varian Circus here, because I can't say this enough, this was a big circus. Uh, it was bigger than the Circus Maximus, but it was also much shorter lived. And in fact, one of the things that's come from the project is while the idea of the circus, of course, as we know, is a very long lived one, and later Roman cities are going to continue to build them, the Varian Circus as an experiment actually has a relatively short life. It's constructed in the third century it is already um, out of use by the time the Aurelian Wall is constructed in the late third century. So it's a short-lived but dramatic gesture. Nonetheless, if we want to give it a glimpse of its moment of glory, this, I think, is what the whole composite would have looked like. You can see this magnificent porticus, uh, the uh, area, the building that is going to become uh, the famous Basilica of the Holy Cross is here, the circus, and at a later stage, this rather marvelous temple is here. Now, I've already mentioned that this circus is relatively short-lived, and here we can see an area where the circus is just cut. The length of the circus is cut by the Aurelian Wall. Its life is cut short. Now, work by our colleagues has already demonstrated that the circus was out of use even before the Aurelian Wall was constructed, and that's one of the great things one of many great examples that come from a close reappraisal of structural archaeology as part of this project. So Aurelian Wall, or the Aurelian Wall, therefore, uh, ushers in a new physical transformation of Rome. And we can see it in a very dramatic way uh, with the way in which that landscape is once again completely remodeled. Um, but what difference does a wall make? Uh, the great uh, Sir Ian Richmond um, came out with this rather fascinating idea about uh, the Aurelian Wall. The world would not know that its greatest city had become a fortified castle, essential part of the plan to build a wall that was strong, but inconspicuous. Now, this is an interesting idea, and it's easy to scoff at it, because we know that it's not really quite true. But why did he say it at the time? This is one of the key questions. Let's have a look at that landscape. Here we have uh, a, an image showing you how the Castra Nova dominated this space. Here we have our visualization based on a comprehensive reassessment of the evidence of the area of the Aurelian Wall through to the Porta Asinaria. And the, the last person to have done a comprehensive visualization of this structure was Sir Ian Richmond. So, I think that that is quite a conspicuous feature in the landscape, one that changes the way people approach the city of Rome. Why did Richmond not feel that? Well, to understand that, we need to go back to the history of 20th century research in the area. And here you have the portrait scenario um, prior to the restoration works of the 1950s. It's still obviously an imposing feature, but unbeknown to Richmond, because the work wasn't published at the time of his magnum opus, there had been a small excavation under the center between those two towers. 
and it had revealed something else. There, by the way, is a rather nice set of images, often reproduced, showing Richmond's view of how the Fortress scenario, and with it the Aurelian Wall, underwent transformation. Now, what we've been able to do, thanks to many colleagues in Rome, is to reaccess again, these historic excavations. Once again, these are areas that are not safe for the general public to access. They're not generally available. Uh, in this particular one, we had to have a specialist conservation team uh, come in to, to basically clean it down and make it accessible for archaeological recording. Um, but in entering it, in re-entering it, in resurveying it, you know, it is crucial to the project, making sure that everything is in the right spatial relationships uh, with the more obvious um, structural archaeology that you can see above the surface. Uh, we were able to demonstrate a number of things. One of the most important things is the degree to which the ground surface at this point has changed in antiquity. This opening that it might be tempting to think of as a mini gateway through the Asinaria is not a mini gateway at all. Uh, what this is, is when an original portal, much bigger in the Asinaria, has been blocked. And because of consistent flooding events in this part of Rome, uh, new um, uh, channels had to be produced to prevent flooding of the new higher ground surface. In essence, then, that and other observations that we can make show that the Porta Asinaria was a much bigger, more monumental structure than Richmond realized, several meters higher, in fact, anything but the most bigness. So we continue to work on the Asinaria and to better understand it. But it has to be seen now as embracing a new Rome as well with the arrival of Constantine. Now, the big monument, really, from Constantinian Rome, I think, in this case, would be the Arch Basilica of uh, the Lateran. Uh, this is the world's first cathedral. Uh, this is the cathedral of the Bishop of Rome, the cathedral of the Pope, not the Vatican. And it remains, by the way, his uh, cathedral to this day. It's also an area that I think one could legitimately say uh, was uh, for a millennium one of the most important places in Western Christendom by far. It was home to popes, it was a place where kings were crowned. It was also a place that powerfully influenced ideas about what the liturgy should look like, how Christian worship should be conducted. Now, the decision in the aftermath of the Battle of Milton Bridge in the early fourth century by Constantine to give the land that had been previously part of the militarized landscape of Severan Rome to the church has profound consequences. The castra site, which we saw a moment ago, is then replaced by yet another monumental structure, this time a cathedral. Understanding that basilica is extremely important to us, and it's part of a project that predated Rome transforms, and my apologies if some of this is repetition to you. Um, but it involves methods that we use for that project that help form our approach here. Again, detailed digital modeling of what is above and below ground, reinterpretation of the whole, along with archival material, allowed us to do detailed visualizations of those provocations uh, that would help us to better understand how the idea of the first cathedral was conceptualized, articulated, and presented. It also has allowed us to try other forms of model, including acoustic modeling. For those who are interested in liturgy in the early church, there are often perilously few uh, clues to work from. But one thing we can do is work back from architecture and get a little bit of understanding of how sound moves in some of these spaces, how that relates to the movement of sound in other similar types of structures at the time, reception halls, for example, um, and therefore how these spaces would have operated. So we have a situation where a basilica takes the place of a fort in a dominant position in our landscape. But there's also another development when we think about liturgy. A great scholar of a liturgical uh, change in activity, Sybil de Blau, has noted that the relationship of the basilica to the first baptistry, the first part of the baptistry, raises its own interesting questions about the nature of worship in the early church. Now, one of the challenges for us when applying the same method that we've been applying elsewhere to this building 
is how we get a transformation from what is a fast contract, which originally was going to have to be done and served before, to a faster stream. And in order to do that, we've again gone through the same array of data, a lot of detailed scanning, accompanied by detailed on-site structural analysis, and crucially, hydrological uh, analysis too, of hydrology. One point that is fairly obvious is that actually the pre-existence of a bath complex was an important factor in the development of the lake factor. But another point that is perhaps less obvious is when the shift to a purpose-built factor stream happens. And here, uh, a little bit of spoiler alert, the excellent pioneering work of my colleague, uh, Kaya Lassi, uh, and uh, with her working with her has raised the very real question that actually the purpose-built factor stream is often itself been identified as a constant Tinian state, may in fact be fixed on the stream. Now, moving on from this, we have a rather new approach to flow. There is the silica as we model it, uh, understood, emerging. What's happening elsewhere? Well, a similar sort of pattern of transformation is happening elsewhere at the eastern end of our research area. Same approach here ground penetrating radar, structural analysis above ground and below ground. This has allowed us to get a visualization of what that Severin structure you saw a moment ago within the Santa Croce Sasorian complex might have looked like. One important finding is that we realized that it had its own hydraulic system or bath complex associated with it, something that's not been discussed extensively uh, before. Its adaptation to the church building through the addition of maps in the late antique period is a relatively straightforward development. So let us now look at some themes as we go into the fifth century into late antiquity. And I should emphasize that we are still uh, a good few months short of the end of our project. We have a very big transformation um, conference coming up in Rome and online in March, um, which I hope as many colleagues as possible will join us for. So we're still working through some of our ideas about later antique development. Um, but one obvious shift that happens is that the Aurelian wall, I mean, the paper gets a, a makeover, rather more than one makeover, in fact, and we see a change um, in the height of the wall. So that uh, of the wall grows even larger. Now, you would have noted something there. That is not because I have failed to correlate my slides. What you're actually seeing is also the shift in the ground surface. Those two slides actually are based on the same space. So on the one hand, we've got the ground level change. We've got a great emphasis on that vitality, but there is other building that is going on in relation to all of the structures that are there already. Obviously, scholars of late antiquity are acutely aware of this. Uh, life goes on, it goes on in an exciting and powerful way. But there is another thing that I think is extremely interesting with the uh, evidence that we have, uh, that the literal is often referring to the way in which ruins are being removed. And of course this makes sense. Obviously we think about that which endures, we tend to model that which endures but the number of things that are being removed, sometimes level, consequences of the ground surface being one of many. And that this is celebrated, if you like, as its own form of monumentality, uh, the removal of ruins, the repurposing of ruins. And this is not, of course, in the antiquity For example, it celebrates the excavation of this battle of land between the Pyrenal Hill and the Capitol. So these are other kinds of monumentality. As we work through the individual buildings, there are often very compellingly human reminders from the archaeology of what is involved to continue living in these spaces into late antiquity. This fine building, for example, that we worked on uh, immediately adjacent to the Lateran Basilica underneath the Ospedale of San Giovanni, uh, has a superb um, uh, floor, marble floor. What we can see here are multiple small repairs inserted into the hole. More significantly within the complex as a whole, we can also see uh, other indications um, of how uh, these buildings are in themselves being repurposed uh, for different small, probably religious communities 
uh, that are offering satellite uh, communities in the area of the basilica itself. In addition to this, uh, we can see the further elaboration of innovative religious structures. Here, for example, adjacent to the baptistry, and that's the baptistry as it stands today, uh, we can see how the bath complex that I showed you earlier on, parts of that have been repurposed as well. In this case, uh, my esteemed colleague Paolo Liberani, who has done so much to make this project possible, and has been a wonderful uh, co-director throughout, um, ha has uh, led the charge, and I've, I've rather followed this, I think, rather brilliant idea, um, that we have the Nymphaeum of Pope Hilarus, uh, 5th century water uh, elaboration, emphasizing in a new architectural form uh, within Rome's uh, great ancient monuments, uh, another way of presenting a new Christian architecture. And it's from the epistyle of the portico of Hilarus that we again find this important theme. This place once occupied by the squalor of a heap of ruins um, has been transformed. So that's another pattern of transformation, the sheer effort involved. And it's very interesting to look at that alongside other themes, such as ongoing evidence for water supply, to see elements of continuity, and reference to that which was there in the past, as well as evidence of innovation. Now, there are many things that I could say about the uh, late antique transformations that we're trying to wrestle with, but I'd like to just conclude with some thoughts from the 8th century towards the end of our period. In a lot of ways, by the 8th century, many of the key landscape features that we can see in Rome today have been established. Uh, one or two that would have framed uh, activity in a fundamental way have, however, since been uh, demolished. Uh, the Patriarchium, for example, or the original palace associated uh, with the Basilica, uh, was destroyed uh, in the uh, 15th century, 16th century, sorry. Um, and one of our challenges is to try and revisualize that important complex, uh, which was so powerfully uh, influential. Um, but we can see that there is a recurrence of returning to keeping these structures impressive, invested in, and influential. There is an element of creating a new Rome from an ancient Rome. Some of the best known bronzes, of course, of Rome were actually brought to this area and uh, displayed uh, within it, creating a new sense of center. And these were so powerfully influential that in time, Charlemagne, who was thinking of his own appropriate style of palace building as a way of presenting imperial power, drew on the inspiration of this area, uh, the Lateran, in terms of determining not only the shape of his new palace, but also even his own collection of bronzes. So the Patriarchium is one of those structures that was proved profoundly influential in its own right. Scala Santa was, again, an area that was to go on to have a significance within that complex, drawing many thousands of pilgrims to this day. So when we look at the transformation, there are many different lessons we can uh, perhaps reflect on. One of them is the importance of the Severum transformation right the way across the area. The degree to which Severus both militarized Rome and rebuilt Rome is too often underestimated. The area of the Aurelian Wall that we've looked at has sometimes been used as a reference point for understanding the Aurelian Wall, but in reality, we've concluded that it's probably one of the least well understood areas, and it actually provides evidence for some very dramatic remodeling and innovation. The Constantinian transformation exploits structures and spaces developed under Severus and uses them in imaginative new ways. And those end up becoming formative of people's expectations, not only of Christian architectures, but of what people do with Christian architectures. From the late fourth century, we do see a lot of other changes and key decisions being made. What do we repair? What do we remove? And where do we make the difference between where we bury our dead and uh, share the activities of the living? And it's in this stage and onwards, the impact of the church proves utterly fundamental. And it's at this time that we see the emergence of a pattern that is then very, very strong by the end of our period. This is the center of Christendom, and it influences people's ideas, not only about the church, but about 
uh, how power should be articulated in Charlemagne. So we'll be looking at this in still more detail a few months further down the road when we have our three-day uh, Rome Transform Transformation Conference. Um, please keep an eye out. Uh, we'll keep information online for you. Um, and we'll be showing more of our images, not only of the transformation structures, but of entire landscapes, and crucially, exploring what those mean, not only for the transformation of life in Rome over eight centuries, but for the way that Rome influenced the transformation of life more widely. Thank you very much. Ian, thank you so much. Um, that was uh, a transformational in our understanding um, of what a wonderful project. And I, um, before I open up for questions from the room, just to take uh, President's privilege and, and ask one myself. Um, you, um, th this project, and I, I had a great experience in a pre-project in crawling around underneath the latter and with you at one stage. Um, this is a you know, huge project. Uh, how big was the team? And um, roughly, what's the budget of this? Just to. to so, thanks to the DLC, our, our funding body, uh, we have a budget of 2.5 million euros. And uh, this, this is our team. And I would note that actually, we've got 20 people who provided total on both parts yep. of the project. I think that's just we got ourselves in. So it's quite a large team, but they're they're they they're they are. Yep. Something that uh, twenty years ago we would, couldn't have conceived of doing without the scale of, of research. No, I think I, I think we've been very 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 fortunate to be to be able to pull together a, a large team and colleagues with so many different special skills. I mean, I, 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 Yes, it's it's been a really, really wonderful roller coaster ride when we have those different different level of specialities and how they can hopefully uh, continue to uh Questions? Um, I wonder if you could uh, comment on Day's uh, revision of uh, Krautheimer, to what extent was his day, that is, reanalysis of what you might call abandoned or rural suburban road actually depop depopulated or rather developed as great houses with eventually catacombs and uh, then little churches or big churches associated with them. I mean, your example, of course, is, is an enormous one, the Lateran, but to what extent is the same sort of thing going on in relatively depopulated or sparsely populated areas in a similar way? I appreciate the project may not have been devoted to that, but I wondered if you could, as it were, enlarge from yours onto some other often adjacent areas. Thank you very much for the question. Sorry, really, I'm not house trained, I'm sorry. Um, is, is that coming through okay? Yeah. Many, many thanks uh, for that question. Um, one of the, so one of the challenges, and I'll offer a caveat to begin with, one of the challenges that, that I'm finding with this is yes, we are, explicitly aiming to explore themes that have a broader resonance, while at the same time keeping a tight hold of the fact that there are certain things that are happening in this area which are, I think, very distinctive to this area. But it is interesting if we, for example, go further out into an area that might be less sparsely populated, if we go out along the Via Labicana uh, to the east, um, there are interesting points there in terms of the transition. We come to areas of substantial catacombs. Um, we see substantial changes in terms of the development of uh, new church forms of church basilica. One of the questions that I find it difficult to navigate around is 
who are the agents of all of these different changes? I mean, some of the recent work by Paolo Liberani on those, I think, is a very important contribution to discussions that Krautheimer and Day and others have already had. So who are the agents of these changes? And in our area, we have, I think, a particularly strong um, sense of the reach at various stages of imperial power on what's happening with the structures, the development of structures, and then the ongoing investment in those structures. Um, in the Sasorian, one sees this, for example, also with Elena's uh, in, investment in substantial in the repair of a substantial bath complex in an area that might otherwise seem to be relatively sparsely populated. So one of the things that I find quite interesting is the intersection not just of ecclesial architecture or concentrations of catacombs, um, but that we have some of these large uh, hydraulic complexes that are being built where we can't necessarily see a particularly dense population in the immediate vicinity. So basically wrestling with the problem, but seeing again and again that this perhaps not an original sentiment, that, that some of the big shifts in architecture are happening at places that are already um, identified as significant in the wider topography of, of East and Southeast Rome. Hello, um, just wondering if there were any restrictions on the work that you were allowed to do. Um, were you given free reign in all the areas you were working at? Thank you. Um, actually, that's the slide I want. Um, free reign, no. Um, we had the, oh, remember the mic, right? We were extremely fortunate. Uh, to win from the very beginning. And again, my friend Paolo Liberani played a, an absolutely the central role, I would say, in, in securing uh, the, the goodwill and uh, generous collaboration of many of these partners. We're extremely fortunate um, to have a convenzione established at the beginning. We were able to establish a convenzione which allowed us access. Um, we did have a basic rule that our work would be non-intrusive. If there was any work that had to be done, for example, mortar sampling, that would be a, the result of a separate protocol. When we did do that, because the opportunity, for example, to look at comparative building materials from one area to another, uh, or when we were doing uh, drill hole boring, we did have to look very carefully there uh, as well at, at separate written agreements, both with the authorities and of course with local stakeholders. So um, in general, we were given access to everything we wanted to look at. And if one goes back six years, I remember sort of hunched over images of Google Earth and thinking that's a nice bit of green space. Could we look there? And being very grateful when actually the answer was almost overwhelmingly yes, sometimes took a while. But I think the one that gave me the most sleepless nights would have been the borehole campaign because we were drilling sometimes up to 20 meters beneath the modern ground surface. And of course, amongst other things, there is a complex metro network in that area. And there are quite a lot of utilities that are not mapped. So we had to study those, uh, all, all sources for that before we drilled. And people were very generous in their support, but one had to proceed understandably very cautiously there. Unless, sorry. Unless I mis misunderstood, it seems that the two great churches in the um, region both had elements of bathhouses in them. Uh, they both have evidence of bathhouses underneath them. Underneath. That is correct. Um, but um, I can give you a much more specific answer in terms of the way that works. Um, and I would also say that the bulk of the bathhouse in the Lateran the earlier bathhouse actually lies under the separate building, which is the Lateran Baptistry. And that is, although the two had a, an intimate liturgical relationship, of course, um, they are separate structures. And that's something that you see in other parts of Rome, but is it something, is it fascinating? Do you see that in other parts of the Roman Empire that bathhouses are being converted into Absolutely, silicons? because they're, they're splendid, big, 
big buildings. And so they offer all sorts of opportunity. But there is another twist to your question, I would suggest, which is that um, when you look at the issue of the right of baptistry, um, because of the pioneering and incredibly important work of many of our colleagues who are specialists in early baptistries, there's often been a tendency to focus on the baptistry as a special building. If we look at some of the literary evidence, I think we also have to acknowledge that quite a lot of early ba uh, baptistry, ba baptisms would have taken place in other types of bath building as well. That's one of the ways our evidence is pointing us, certainly. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I discovered from your talk, slightly embarrassingly, that I stayed at this site in August <laughs> at the Doma Sessoriana. I recommend um, it, yes. And I just wondered where, which adjoins the Church of St. Jerusalem. I can't say it in Italian. Um, is just that building I stayed in, it was, I believe, originally the site of St. Elena's uh, house or monastery. Do you know? Did you investigate that site or...? Yes, thank you. The, the, the very good hotel if you're staying in Rome, actually. Um, uh, and yeah, it's not it's not too expensive at all, and uh, it's got lots of rooms, lots and lots of rooms. Um, so yes, that that would have been um, the the associated um, uh, house for the religious associated with the the basilica, um, and uh, we've actually frequented that hotel extensively. It offers great laser scanned views of the church fabric from multiple angles, and indeed contains quite a lot of the church within it. Um, but before I reminisce too much, your question was more specifically on, on the, the issue of, uh, yes, the, the Constantinian imperial family and that relationship, yes. I mean, I think what we are seeing is uh, imperial agency here very, very clearly. I think that the tradition uh, that uh, this part of the Imperial Palace and what we know is an Imperial Palace from the Severan period onwards uh, definitely benefits from the presence of Elena. Um, and there is investment in, in the area, not only in the um, what becomes the Basilica itself, but in the uh, substantial adjacent bath suite and in some of the other residences nearby. So yes, these are cases where as you will appreciate, I know, um, the structural archaeology doesn't necessarily come with a, always a, a very clear, tightly datable link to a, a particular imperial agent. But I'm absolutely sure that the presence of the Empress will have had a significant uh, set of implications for how that area was transformed. Ian, um, thank you so much. Uh, that's a, a wonderful uh, lecture on um, what is a fantastic project. I myself am much looking forward to uh, three days in Rome uh, in March when I'm attending your conference in person. Um, so can we express our thanks to Ian uh, for a splendid talk? <laughs> um, I, I give notice that the next meeting will be the Christmas soiree on Thursday the 14th December when we'll hear a paper, The History of Christmas by Professor Ronald Hutton Fellow, um, which will be followed by the traditional mulled wine reception. Um, regrettably, for those of you who haven't already booked, it's booked out already and uh, there's a waiting list, but uh, um, you can join the waiting list by um, going online if you wish or join us um, online. Um, the meeting stands adjourned. Um, there is uh, drinking.